<laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm here with my good friend Mohit Chawla today. Uh, I don't think he slept yesterday, so we'll try to keep this as short as possible. And uh, to the uh, to all the you know people watching, uh, Mohit is a grad student at Cornell Tech, doing a lot of stuff in data science, machine learning, recommendation systems, AI, all of this kind of stuff. And um, and I thought it would be good to to talk with Mohit about how a lot of the systems work and what are their impacts to you know to the lives of everyday people, and also to help us understand these things a little bit more. So I thought maybe a good thing to start off with is you know you should introduce yourself, what were you doing before, like how you got here, and also maybe what you're working on now as well. Sure. First of all, thanks for the introduction, Ranjit. So, I'm Mohit, I'm a graduate student in the two years program at Cornell Tech and I have, I come from a software engineering background, I was a full-time software engineer for Samsung Research right. and I am mostly the back-end guy, although I can work on <laughs> the stack, but uh, and my interest in this space is very difficult to design, define. Mm -hmm. I have been working on small side projects and projects which I feel are usable and uh, uh, can be used to uh, improve the life via technology. Mm -hmm. If constrained, I would say general software engineering and machine learning and recommendation systems are the spaces. And uh, for my startup studio, we are working on Xboard. Xboard is a collaborative platform for teams mm -hmm. to train, test, deploy, and monitor machine learning models all in one place. Got it. It's a really cool project. Um, but you know, if he doesn't want to take this further for a startup, he's got a good job lined up. And uh, yeah, okay. So maybe stepping back a little bit first, like how, like maybe even before like Cornell Tech, can you just explain a little bit like maybe what you were doing at Samsung, like just like a brief like intro? Sure. So at Samsung, I was part of the Enterprise and Services Division. What our team was supposed to do is uh, we were focused on creating the back end architecture mm -hmm. for eSIM. That is, uh, so how does our phones work these days? You buy a new phone, you put a SIM card onto it, mm -hmm. and then you register and you start uh, working. Okay. But uh, Samsung's vision for regarding the same is to uh, opt like to make these SIM cards obsolete. Like literally, you turn on the phone, you connect to a Wi-Fi, you select the operator, AT&T, Verizon, mm -hmm. Airtel, or whatever, and then you select a plan and bingo and do some authentication via thumbprint or depending upon country and bingo you're good to go. Mm. And you can switch operator and plans whenever you want. So uh, my team was create this was an eSIM project right. and my team was responsible for creating the backend architecture for authentication and complete flow of buying plans, registering and other stuff. Wow. Intense. So then what like, then after that what got you thinking about doing data science and like machine learning and then like how you got into I guess working with your research on like recommendation systems and how did that show sure. well? So after Samsung I switched to, uh, shifted to Connect Tech mm -hmm. and then uh, what happens is uh, as part of two semester research projects we were working on a, uh, our initial thesis was uh, RNNs, that is recurrent neural networks, a type of uh, neural networks are go to things for time series data. Okay. So our hypothesis was can different type of networks like special CNNs which are called TCNs perform better. So for the first semester we worked on that as part of recommendation systems research and it was uh, nice to see how the model just by the user's preferences can automatically detect that it's summer season so I should recommend this movie. It's winter season, so I should recommend Die Hard. So the idea was just by looking at the average use, user group ratings, can you inherently, can the model inherently learn that it's summer, it's supposed to recommend Baywatch hypothetically, it's winter, mm -hmm. it's Christmas time, people are watching Die Hard. Mm -hmm. So that was the first semester. Then while doing that research, we faced some issues regarding reusability. We were writing similar code again and again. So we decided to create plat a platform called... Yeah, we'll take, take a step back about recommendation systems. Like, like maybe in like, in like simpler terms, what what would you say is a like recommendation system? What are the things that make it a recommendation system? And yeah, like just what is that? I guess. Sure. A simple. If I have to explain a recommendation system in a very simplest layman's way, mm. 
uh, a good example would be to explain a type of recommendation system called collaborative filtering. Let's collaborative say, filtering. Collaborative filtering. Okay, cool. So let's say that uh, you want to, you have a user, and uh, let's say you own a movie place, and you have a bunch of movies, and different users come and watch movies. Let's say you are Netflix. Now you want to recommend movies to one of the users, say Ronson. So how would you do that? You know that Ronson has watched these hundred movies in the past. You know other mo other users have watched different movies. So to recommend a new movie to Ronson, I can simply find users uh, which have watched movie movies which are very similar to Ronson or watched the exact hundred movies which Ronson has watched mm -hmm. and recommend the remaining movies to Ronson. Like let's say I have watched 105 movies and Ronson has watched 100 movies and we have watched common 100 movies. So I can recommend the rest 5 movies to Ronson based on the fact that our tastes are very similar. So this mm -hmm. is very layman's way of explaining uh, recommendation systems. Interesting. So the intuition is saying that because we're very similar, even the thing that is that you have that I don't have, I'm likely to also want to see. Yes, it. yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, and then you were saying that you were building these things. But then, how did you get on to what you're doing now? Like, what, what was it? How, how, did you, how did that happen? So, that was a general observation. Uh, so, I took applied machine learning course and other courses. And during all these machine learning projects, I observed that I was wasting a lot of time time writing redundant code for some basic things like comparing different models, mm -hmm. loading data sets, get, tra triggering the training of the model. Okay. So, uh, then I realized that the existing platforms we use, like general Python or uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks that we use for data science and machine learning are slightly lagging in reusability terms. Mm -hmm. So a better way to explain that would be there is Python. There are different libraries which allow users allow coders to do certain repetitive work by directly calling functions. So what is the next layer of abstraction in machine mm -hmm. learning slash computing? Right. So according to me, it would be like again uh, organizing reusable stuff mm -hmm. and then making it click based or just function based. Would you say it's almost making uh, like machine learning more accessible so that you don't really have to be a super hardcore programmer to be able to use it? Or do you still have to be a programmer to use it? I would say you would still have to be a programmer to use it, but you have right now the focus is like 60% in writing programs and with investing a lot of time in setting up the model itself, mm -hmm. and then 40% in the actual algorithm and all the experiments, right. which are very inorganized across different actual sheets comparing different models, mm -hmm. but what if we squeeze the initial 60% to only 20% and so that the researcher has to just focus, has 80% of time to focus on the actual algorithm and his experiments. Got it. Is this, it's like a live, like there's a live website about it, right? Or not? We have no, so the idea is to, since people, since the users would be uh, resistant in sharing data, so it's like a project that you can uh, download and mm -hmm. uh, install locally in your own server. So basically, on-premise installations. We right now don't support like you go on a website and train everything there because we don't want to spend money. Got it. So that, that, that's pretty technical, even even for me. I feel sometimes like I, I saw the demo on my. It's very, there's a lot of stuff happening on there. But so maybe we can like switch to something a little bit different. Sure. Um, like all these things that you're building. Yeah, like all these systems for other people to, like other companies to, to use. How are these systems being used like today? Like for instance, why are companies training, like why do they need to use the things that you were saying? And how are they using it? Also, how is it affecting their users maybe as well? Like, okay. yeah. So three questions. So the <laughs> first question is why and how are the companies using machine learning in general right. or the platforms around machine learning? So for all the viewers who don't know about machine learning, uh, mm -hmm. you can imagine it as a black box where you show a lot of input, a lot of input and output examples to the black box, and it automatically figures out an uh, adjustment of knobs or numbers so that it can uh, map this relation well. For example. Uh, let's say you want to make a machine learning model that detects a car is present in an image or not, simply. Mm -hmm. So you have 1 million images with uh, uh, some, with human labeled examples like yes, there's a car, no, there's no Human labeled as in like somebody, like somebody these images? Yes. Okay. Somebody, would, somebody went through one each of the 1 million images and said yes, no, yes, no, there's a no. car, no, yes, no. Now you create a model, you put all these images and you know what is the answer, like yes or no. 
So the model uh, adjusts itself so that it can map this input output relationship. That is machine learning. So why? Um, so a, a model, just to be clear, is just like some software program. Right? Yes, it's a software okay. program basically. Uh, so why uh, companies need it is because there are some uh, tasks which are very difficult to uh, write program for. Like mm -hmm. a simple car, a simple example is the car detection in, a, in an image only. So we leave it uh, to be com on the computer to learn how to approximate the algorithm and how to learn to model this problem. Mm -hmm. And how they are doing this is by creating different uh, models. By models, I mean different types of software, which uh, software programs which uh, do this, and then picking the best one and then using it and in integrating it with their product, maybe as a REST API. So, so then, why is it only recently, or not recently? Like, why is it now that companies like talk about all this stuff? I mean, people have been thinking about this for a while. Sure. But why is it just recent? Like, everybody's talking. That's a very good question. So, for those who don't know, machine learning has been going on for over decades. I think in 1958, in Cornell only, Rosenblatt uh, uh, started uh, created a perceptron. Mm -hmm. But uh, why now? It's because as we discussed the car yes or no example, you need a you need one million images. You need that much data. But that much data was not available earlier. But with the mm -hmm. advent of internet, we have a lot of data. So one now we have a lot of data. Two. There was not much computing power, but in 1970s transistors came, then like VLSI and uh -huh. all other technology improved, so the compute power improved. So these are the two important factors which lead to the chances of why now machine. More data and more compute power. Interesting. Okay. And then, so how, how is this, uh, like in your opinion, affecting the way users interact with products? Like how, how does it change how, how you like I use a website, for instance. So, and maybe we can take an example as well, like if it's better. Sure. So I would uh, let's take an example of recommendation systems only. So all your recommendation systems were like deterministic that you were writing software mm -hmm. uh, that would just that just like we discussed re recommending something to Ramjan based on our similarity. Mm -hmm. So you know why was made why was the model making certain decisions. Why was the algorithm or the software was making certain decisions that why did it recommend those five movies to launch them? So you could debug this thing. But now we are using machine learning models. So since it's a black box and it adjusts parameters, and let's say that unfortunately uh, the same system recommends a uh, pawn to uh, launch it, it would be very difficult even for a researcher to debug why did the model make such a decision. Hmm. So the overall gist is machine learning software, what goes inside machine learning software is relatively very difficult as compared to normal early day software which were hmm. deterministic, written by hand, if, else, do, this, that. Hmm. But now it's more like the system figures it out itself. So if the system makes a mistake, it's very difficult for a human to analyze why was the mistake made. Okay. Although there are ways, but it's still a challenge. Interesting. Now the problem, a very recent uh, discussion around it is bias. Mm -hmm. What about the local bias that we are caught in? What do I mean by bias? I recommend five movies to wrongs. Movie, five movies are recommended to wrongs based on our similarity. Based on uh, uh, one of our friend's similarity, ten movies are recommended. But in the end, all of us end up watching a very similar movies, which might be biased or opinionated. So our whole group gets very biased, gets stuck in a local thing. Mm -hmm. So this is like a local bubble. Local bubble, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a very good uh, word. So this is a very ongoing research and this is more uh, problematic when you are recommended news feeds on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So what if a group or a community is inside a local bubble and similarly for Netflix and other software companies. So then do you think that in some ways, let's say, I, I almost get trapped by these recommendation systems in some ways. Like previously, it was so easy to, these systems were kind of easy to work with. So you can all, always go back and like change something. But now it's so complicated that one, it's hard for even the researchers to know how these things work. And two, it basically moves people that are very similar together. And then it almost like keeps them together in some ways. Like, would you say that? That is the case. Yes, that is the case. And unfortunately, this is a very 
according to me, like this is a very big dilemma in recommendation systems. Mm. If I don't recommend Rousin something he likes, then I yeah. as a recommendation system are, is I'm useless. Yeah. But if I recommend something that creates a local bias, again, uh, if, which he likes, then it might create a local bias okay. or bubble. So there is a lot of research going on, and there are there yeah. have been some good work in the field. Yeah. But uh, this is, I think, one of the biggest problems right now. That's uh, going off of that. That's really interesting because let's say for something that I think is is like an interesting phenomenon, like with the re how recommendation systems work, is that let's say I'm let's say okay, so you're talking about the user that's consuming the content. But let's say the people that are creating the content. I feel that it, the recommendation system also changes how they create content as well. Their decisions are now, is it biased by these recommendation systems too? You know, like instead of creating, let's say, videos about, let's say, I like videos about, you know, sushi or something. Now I'm going to create videos about like cheeseburgers because I know everybody likes cheeseburgers. Like, how, I guess, do you think that, like, do you think that also causes people to go into like a bigger bubble? Yes. And then like, how do you think, so do you think people should just create stuff, like how do you think content creators maybe should interact with these systems? Like, well, how should they think about it almost? Sure. So that's a very good question. What you're talking about is a feedback loop for, from consumers to mm -hmm. the creators themselves. Feedback loop. So that is a very, uh, that is very possible. Uh, if you, if the viewers want to understand it, understand it by a YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Like let's say, let's say there are like millions and millions of videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. YouTube recommends uh, some local, locally biased videos like hypothetically cat videos to everyone. Right. Now everyone ends up watching cat videos a lot. So if I am a creator and I want to create a video, I would see that, okay, cat videos, 10 million views, dude, I'm gonna earn thousands of dollars. Let's make cat videos. Whereas I might love dogs. So I am, so this, <laughs> it, this started from the recommendations the recommendation from the YouTube, mm -hmm. it went to create a bubble. Now that bubble affected me as a creator and I'm again reinforcing that, mm -hmm. uh, creating more cat videos, more are uh, recommended and so on and so forth. So this creates a very big bubble, which is again a very major area of research. Got it. So then, do you think that there there are ways of um, to go around this? Like you said, to like I, I like I like cat videos, so you should recommend me cat videos. If you don't, I'm not gonna like it. Like, how do you think about this dilemma then? Is there a solution to this, or is this like this is the dilemma of life? You know? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> So this is a dilemma of like where you want to go on to the same path or just diversify right. in general. So I, th <coughs> I think, uh, of course, you do. Mohit thinks about life a lot too. Uh, Apart from yeah. machine learning. <laughs> so other than the, of course, the recommendation systems dilemma, you, of course, researchers are trying their best to get uh, their users out of these bias. Mm -hmm. And that is removing bias from the recommendations made to you. But I would like to answer this question uh, in uh, from the shoes of consumer mm. so the, rather than a researcher for as a consumer what I do is I of course the moment I open YouTube mm. I see that my all the recommendations are super tuned to my needs mm -hmm. but they are very similar to what I want but they are literally same I don't mm. want to keep watching again and again for example if once I search about let's say Hawaii I see all the Hawaii related stuff on the on my YouTube recommendations right but I might wanna watch something different. So what I generally do is I go to Google, I search something different which I want to do and then subscribe to those channels so that I keep shuffling my feeds mm. uh, so that the user profile that you uh, that YouTube has about me, mm. that this guy likes this, this and this, I keep shifting that by unsubscribing and subscribing to different channels and searching different terms. Yeah. But it's slightly time consuming. Yeah, and you, user uh, has to be conscious whether they are getting into this yes. bubble. So you're almost saying like as a user, you have the power to go and almost like manipulate the recommendation system. Yes. Yeah, yes. Interesting. There are like, in fact, there are lots of videos on YouTube itself which say how to trick YouTube's recommendation system into doing certain things. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So originally I was going to get Mohit to jump into a little bit of the math, but you know, I think since, since times, uh, sure, we probably wouldn't talk too much about it. Sure. Maybe that's like for 
Episode 2? No, no, no. We're going to do a season one. Yeah, yeah. yeah Women of the Issues is 101. 102. 102. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, maybe just like more generally than like, for you personally, like where where are you going, let's say, next? And how, like, yeah, maybe that's that's the first question. Like, what, what are you going to do after after Conan? So, the answer to that lies in what I want to do generally. Right. My goal in life is, in a sentence would be, to design technology for the main goal that it was meant to be, to help humans. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so to do that, uh, I think one of the biggest problems right now is its inclusiveness. Technology is not inclusive to all. Like, I as a computer science person can do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like, a simple thing as OCR, that recogn uh, recognizing what text is in the image and stuff. Okay. But a common man cannot. So, I am lucky to be accepted to a company uh, called Instabase. It's a startup mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Instabase. They are trying to create a platform around it, around data. So it's like a, uh, and I'll be joining them as a software engineer. So the idea uh, ha is you have a lot of data, you don't have to share it before you guys think about it. And you want to do certain tasks on them. Let's say that uh, you want to create a loan processing system and you have a lot of finances data. You have a lot of application forms. Uh, you are a bank employee, you have a lot of application forms mm -hmm. and you want to uh, process them, convert them to text, searchable text and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So a normal person can, so imagine you have apps for each of this or let's say you are a product manager with zero technical experience and you have a database of sales mm -hmm. which you want to make sense of. So there, you can have an app for that which summarizes the database for you automatically. You mm -hmm. don't have to write code for, write queries for the database. So, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, right now different companies do, do these things, for example Periscope Data does a very good job at summarizing data mm -hmm. base. But what if you have a platform where you log in, you have a bunch of apps, you have your own data, you use those apps on your uh, data to get what you need rather than writing code again and again and different people across different companies, across mm -hmm. different countries and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Instabase is creating the reusability among the next, le according to me this is the next abstract layer of abstraction in computing. Interesting. Yeah. So people doing computing on their own data. Yes, without writing code, which is important. Like if Rongzen is a good computer vision researcher and he created an OCR app, for those who don't know, it's like mm -hmm. uh, character recognition. Uh, so if he has done a very good job at doing that, I should, I in a different company should not do that again. Other researchers in a different company should not do that again. We mm -hmm. can reuse the same thing. So a platform uh, with apps for data. Interesting. And that builds a lot also on top of like what you've been doing now. Yes, it's, it's, it aligns very much with my thesis here. Interesting. Okay. In the interest of time, we may have to do another episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, this was a really good introduction and I think it's like really good general understanding of like how the system works, how the ecosystem works. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. No, you're busy. Sure, you got me coffee. <laughs> Getting hyped on caffeine. <laughs> All right, cool. Dude, thank you. Thanks, Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.